just five hours after American Airlines Flight 77 struck the Pentagon, and without any evidence linking Saddam Hussein to the attacks of 9-11, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld was already ordering his aides to draw up plans for striking Iraq. The notes quote Rumsfeld as saying he wanted, best info fast, judge whether good enough hit SH, meaning Saddam Hussein. Go massive, Rumsfeld continued in the notes. Sweep it all up, things related and not. Soon after September 11th, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld set up a small intelligence office in the Pentagon, the Office of Special Plans, to create the rationales for the already planned attack on Iraq, to convince people that Saddam Hussein possessed weapons of mass destruction and that he was linked to Al-Qaeda and 9-11. Lieutenant Colonel Karen Kwiatkowski worked in the Pentagon's Near East and South Asia office, she witnessed how the Office of Special Plans issued talking points about Iraq for senior government officials, allegedly based on intelligence. The information in there drawn from fact, you could find bits and pieces of fact throughout, but framed, articulated, crafted to convince someone of what? Well, of things that weren't true, things that weren't true. 911, Al-Qaeda related to Saddam Hussein, possibly some involvement there. The liberation of Iraq is a crucial advance in the campaign against terror. We've removed an ally of Al-Qaeda. The very things that a year later, President Bush himself denies and, and feigns his surprise. I don't know why everybody thinks that. We, we, we've had no evidence that Saddam Hussein was involved with the September the 11th. Well, I worked in a place where they concentrated on, on preparing this storyline and selling it to everyone that they could possibly sell it to. It wasn't a failure of intelligence. It was the manipulation of intelligence to achieve a political goal. They were disciplined. They stayed on message. They marshaled all of their forces in this relentless public relations campaign to convince the American people that there was a threat from Iraq. It's day four of the Bush team's full court press, giving speech after speech after speech and issuing reports. The United States knows that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. Any country on the face of the earth with an active intelligence program knows that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. There is no doubt that Saddam Hussein now has weapons of mass destruction. There is no doubt that he is amassing them to use against our friends, against our allies, and against us. The choice is his, and if he does not disarm, the United States of America will lead a coalition and disarm him in the name of peace. Out of the president's mouth, vice president's mouth, uh, the same things that were being given to us to put into our superiors, our senior civilian leadership's mouths, these things were not based on intelligence that we saw, that everyone saw. They were based on a very selective reading of the intelligence and then a creative packaging such that you could push through these two big points that the president and the vice president and, and the whole neoconservative community used to justify this preemptive war on, on Iraq. Less than a teaspoonful of dry anthrax in an envelope shut down the United States Senate in the fall of 2001. Their policy depends on deception and secrecy, like every imperial policy in history, even dictatorships have taken great efforts always to disguise what they're doing and why they're doing it to their own people. This was never about weapons. This has always been about getting Saddam Hussein. And even in the most um, you know, recent uh, spin-up of this whole weapons issue, the Bush administration knew that there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and yet they continued to use the inspection process as a vehicle to achieve the ultimate goal and objective of regime change. These guys should be brought up on charges. There should be an investigation about whether these guys should be allowed to serve our country anymore. Because to me, it's criminal to say, we're gonna send our troops to war based on uh, falsified intelligence, based on puffed up, exaggerated details. So successful was the propaganda campaign that by 2003, polls were showing that the vast majority of Americans believed the unfounded claims that Saddam Hussein was linked to 9-11 and that he possessed stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction. Beliefs that allowed the administration to frame an invasion of Iraq as a non-aggressive, 
justified act of self-defense under international law, rather than an offensive action designed to extend U.S. empire. Contrary to the lies told to the American people, Iraq had absolutely no connections with 9-11. Al-Qaeda was despised by the regime in Iraq, which was a secular regime, not interested in religion uh, as such. But <clears throat> they still wanted to go for it. And so they delayed it. They went into Afghanistan first, and then they decided to go for Iraq. Now, why did they decide to go for Iraq? That's the interesting question. Where are Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction? Former Chief Weapons Inspector David Kaye said last week, quote, we were all wrong about Saddam's WMD. By now the world knows there was a massive intelligence failure in the war on Iraq. President Bush and other countries... The failure to find Saddam Hussein's alleged weapons of mass destruction has raised serious questions about the legitimacy and legality of the ongoing war in Iraq. But as both American and Iraqi casualties escalate, and as the conflict becomes more chaotic and deadly by the day, debate within the United States continues to focus narrowly on whether American intelligence agencies provided accurate enough information to justify going to war. In the process, a larger question has been all but ignored. If the war was not about weapons of mass destruction, what is it really about? Pursuing this question, forces us to consider a different story. It is a story that begins as the Cold War ends, a story about a group of self-identified radical conservatives at the right-wing extreme of the Republican Party, a group of intellectuals and policymakers who saw the fall of the Soviet Union and communism not as an opportunity to scale back America's Cold War military machine, but as an opportunity to build up its size and scale, to use military force more aggressively and unilaterally, to construct a new, unchallenged American empire. Repeat after me. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly... When George W. Bush took office in 2000, he brought with him some of the most conservative foreign policy voices in the Republican Party. Chief among them were Vice President Dick Cheney, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, and Deputy Secretary for Defense Paul Wolfowitz, all of whom had served together previously in the administrations of Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. Paul Wolfowitz, in particular, had long been recognized as the intellectual force behind a radical neoconservative fringe of the Republican Party. For years, Wolfowitz had been advancing the idea that the United States should reconsider its commitments to international treaties, international law, and multilateral organizations such as the United Nations. Radical plan for American military domination first surfaced during the administration of George H.W. Bush. In 1992, Paul Wolfowitz, working in the Department of Defense, was asked to write the first draft of a new national security strategy a document entitled The Defense Planning Guidance. The most controversial elements of what would later come to be known as the Wolfowitz Doctrine were that the United States should dramatically increase defense spending, that it should be willing to take preemptive military action, and that it should be willing to use military force unilaterally with or without allies. This new reliance on military force was necessary, according to Wolfowitz, to prevent the emergence of any future or potential rivals to American power, and to secure access to vital resources, especially Persian Gulf oil. Out of power during the Clinton presidency, Wolfowitz and his colleagues affiliated themselves with a number of influential conservative think tanks. In 2000, they would craft yet another proposed national security strategy. This one published by a right-wing think tank calling itself the project for the new American century. At its core, the document revived the Wolfowitz Doctrine. It called on the United States to increase the military budget by up to $100 billion, to deny other nations the use of outer space, and to adopt a more aggressive and unilateral foreign policy that would allow the United States to act offensively and preemptively in the world. The elimination of states like Iraq figured prominently in this grand vision. 
they were coming out against the policy of every American president from Nixon to Clinton to even George Bush in his first year. They wanted to change that. But even these hardline conservatives knew that the Wolfowitz Doctrine was likely too radical to win the support of the foreign policy establishment, their own Republican Party, and the American people. In their defining document, written in September of 2000, a full year before 9-11, they acknowledged that the process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one. Absent, in their own chilling words, some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. One year later, that event would arrive.